Welcome, everybody, to the Mindset Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Dial, and I'm very excited to have my guest, Sam Harris, with me today. If you guys don't know who Sam Harris is, um, I would say, Sam, the best way of, of, of me explaining from what I've seen and read and listened to you is you're kind of the bridge for me of science and a lot of the Eastern philosophies that exist. And for the analytical Western mind like me, makes it more palatable to go, oh yeah, this meditation thing does make sense. <laughs> and mm. it does, it does show how this actually is, ha, does have benefit as well. Do you kind of feel like that's, that's the way it is? And that's what you hear from other people as well, that you're kind of the bridge between the Western analytical mind and then also the Eastern philosophies and religions and, and practices as well. Yeah. Well, that, that, those are definitely two domains I've been conscious of trying to bridge. So I'm happy that it's working for you. Um, I guess I, I'm building a few other bridges as well, but th mm -hmm. that is um, probably uh, my main focus at the moment. And as, as you know, I have uh, a podcast where I talk about all manner of thing and, and, and mm -hmm. much of it can be political and, and unrelated to what we're going to talk about. But mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time uh, in another wheelhouse, which is, which is really uh, mostly focused on my app waking up at the moment. And that's mm -hmm. where I talk about meditation and, and related brain science and, and f find points of contact with Western philosophy. But the truth is there, there hasn't been that many points of contact with Western philosophy of late, right. because it's been a couple of thousand years since Western philosophy was explicitly trying to answer the question of what it means to live a good life. Right? Mm -hmm. how, how do we live a life without regret? So much of philosophy has been totally divorced from that project and devoted to a bunch of interesting, but, but ultimately not all that consequential linguistic games. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I am not, I don't think of myself as a, as you know, consciously focused on the East per se, but there, there isn't a symmetry here, which is that and then this is an analogy that that um, may shock some people, but it you know with respect to wisdom, specifically the wisdom born of of uh, contemplation, meditation, introspection. Mm -hmm. There's this asymmetry where in the East it's a little bit like the the asymmetry between Western and Eastern medicine, right? I mean, like real medicine, medicine that makes serious contact with a biological understanding of, of, you know, what we are as organisms, that is Western medicine. It's not to say that nothing in Eastern medicine has ever worked or, or, but, but for the most part, if it works, it has to conform to our understanding of biology as it has been born in the West. There really is a, 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 a similarly extreme and invidious asymmetry between the West and the East with respect to contemplative wisdom. And um, we might talk about that, but it's, mm -hmm. so I had just by it's, its very nature, I have, I have uh, drawn a lot of insight from, from Buddhism and, and other you know, Eastern philosophies and, and methodologies. Yeah. And I know, <clears throat> I know you got your degree in philosophy and then also you got your PhD in neuroscience and you've been meditating for 30 years. What, what specific, I guess the first question is how did you get into it? What was like the, the beginning of it? the genesis of, of deciding that, Hey, I want to meditate. And then what, what have you noticed over the past 30 years, as far as I'm really curious, as far as the past 30 years of you meditating, the difference in yourself, but also if you've noticed that, I guess that, that our society is starting to go a little bit more towards mindful. It seems like there's at least a little bit of an awakening to this mindfulness and to actually try to be a little bit more present and try to meditate a little bit more. Have you noticed that as well? Yeah, well, mindfulness is is certainly in vogue, and you know, for for good reasons. It's you know, there, there's a superficiality to much of it, so which is, you know, uh, you know, wor worth at least being aware of, and and you know, if not criticizing. But mm -hmm. um, I think you know, even a little bit of mindfulness is is better than none, and uh, it's it's increasingly popular now because there is so much competition for our, our attention and it's it's so obviously dysfunctional you know I mean, the human mind was painfully distracted 2000 years ago right so you know at, at the time of the buddha the problem you know the, the the explicit problem he was addressing were the consequences of having 
our minds be by default out of control. But there's no question our situation has gotten worse. I mean, we, we've got the most powerful companies on earth right now doing everything possible to pry our attention away from what matters most to us. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're, you know, or what should matter most to us. Um, and people, I think, are becoming more alert to the, the, the consequences of that, both, you know, personally and collectively. It's, it's, you know, personally, we are living lives that, that feel more and more fragmented because in fact they are. And, uh, you know, societally, we are witnessing a, uh, just the, the utterly divisive and deranging consequences of being siloed into, into these bespoke information bubbles and being gamed differentially by algorithms, you know, whether it's YouTube or, or just the consequences of a Google search or what comes, comes into our timeline on Facebook or Twitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, we're, we're, we've all been enrolled in, in a mass psychological experiment to which no one consented and the consequences of which have, are, have not really been thought through. And it's pretty clear that many of the consequences are bad. So uh, you know, but yeah, many, many millions of people now are seeing the need to reclaim their attention. And, you know, I would argue that our attention really is the true source of our wealth in each moment and you know, in therefore each day and over the course of our lives, even more than time. I mean, we, all, we all know what it's like to, to protect our time, but then to squander it because our attention is elsewhere, right? You, you decide to carve out some quality time with your kids uh, and then you find yourself checking your phone uh, and perhaps having to respond to some pseudo emergency born of you know your, your entanglement with it. Uh, and so it's, it, we really have to seize more than time to be making contact with our lives. We need to, we need to be able to pay attention uh, in each moment uh, to what to what is what what actually repays our attention. And meditation is really the art of discovering that and, and training that. Hey, let me tell you about my favorite drink that I take a couple times a day. It's called Athletic Greens. And how I start my day is I drink it first thing in the morning before I do anything else, and then I go meditate. And in 30 seconds, in just one scoop, I get 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. And it has everything that a multivitamin has, plus greens, probiotics, prebiotics, digestive enzymes, immunity formula, adaptogens, and more. And when COVID first hit, I actually ordered this out of my own pocket for my mom because I wanted to keep her immunity up. So if you're looking to upgrade your multivitamin or take one nutritional formula that's going to cover all of your daily nutritional bases, check out Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens makes it so much easier to get high quality nutrition incredibly easy into your diet without the need to buy multiple products. So make an investment today in your health and try out the ultimate all-in-one wellness bundle and support your immunity, gut health, energy by visiting athleticgreens.com slash dial and you'll receive a free year supply of liquid vitamin D for free with your first purchase. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash dial. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized that our eyes were not meant to look at screens all day, and they designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday more productive. Felix Gray lenses filter 15 times more blue light that can help make screen time tough on the eyes, and it also disrupts your sleep if you don't have the right glasses. Felix Gray offers classic frame styles that are hand-finished, they're durable, they're lightweight, and they're really comfortable to wear. So you can buy your blue light lenses that come standard at $95 or add a prescription at checkout and it comes out to 145. If you can notice that screen time is not right for your eyes or if you're noticing that the blue light glasses that you're using are not right for you, start with the best in blue light and try Felix Gray. And with their 30-day money-back guarantee, you have absolutely nothing to lose but your eye strain. So get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century that are designed for modern, hardworking eyes. You have nothing to lose. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash dial for the best blue light glasses on the market. That is F-E-L-I-X G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash dial. You get free shipping, free returns, free exchanges at felixgrayglasses.com slash dial. I love that phrase, attention is our true source of wealth. And, you know, as I've researched and, and watched some of your stuff and, and gone through and done the research for, for this episode, 
one of the things that you said is, is it's kind of just happiness boils down to our present, our, our level of happiness devil, you know, boils down to our present moment and how present we can be. And the, ra- the reality of your life is always now. That's what it is. But one thing that I say is that, you know, if somebody wants to be really good at basketball, if they were to wake up, they've never played basketball before their entire lives. And they just decide, I want to be really good at basketball. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to, from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, 16 hours, play basketball every single day. In six months, you're going to be pretty damn good at basketball. And even if you've, you know, not going to go pro, but you'd be pretty good. What people don't realize, and I feel like in the world that we live in right now is that we wake up and the very first thing that we do is we become distracted and we become distracted for 16 hours. And we've basically unbeknownst to us become pros at being distracted. We have, mm. we have literally distracted ourselves from every single moment from we wake up, we literally, literally look at our text messages or emails. We go to Facebook, Instagram, we wake up, we go through all of those motions, take a shower. And then we listen to something, we go to the work and there's people that distract, 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 and literally we become masters of distraction. And so for us to be in the present moment, number one is so foreign, but it's also hard as hell right now. And um, I'm really curious with you for people who are out there. I know there's a lot of people that listen that meditation is just hard as hell to have to be in the present moment without feeling some anxiety tends to be really hard. So what's the first step for someone that's out there to be able to actually experience the present moment and not be pulled by some distraction? Well, the, the first step is really to notice how distracted you are and that, you know, that can come in in stages, you know, the most people, when they try to meditate, you know, for first, I should say there, there are different styles of meditation, there are different techniques. There are at least two basic principles that, that uh, uh, differentiate various approaches here. Um, and, uh, w- but both uh, entail non-distraction as a, as a basic goal. So Mm -hmm. the, the, the antithesis of meditation, whatever meditation you're attempting is to be lost in thought is to be thinking without knowing that you're thinking, right? So you want to be able to place attention uh, uh, on something and notice, in fact, what you intend to notice in in those moments. Um, And uh, you can do this narrowly. You can try to focus on a single object. So this is, is very common in the beginning, let, let's say you're being taught a you know, form of mindfulness meditation, you're, you're told to pay attention to the breath, say, and then there's nothing magical about the breath, mm-hmm. but it's, it's always appearing, right? As long as you're alive, you're breathing, and it's, it's fairly salient. You, you can notice it. And unlike a mantra or some visualization or anything else you might strategically add to your experience, it doesn't require any kind of you know, kind of buy in with respect to concepts right you don't have to you know if someone gives you a mantra for mm-hmm. of a sanskrit syllable as happens in in techniques like like tm you immediately begin thinking well you know why what's what's so important about these syllables and you know what is it a little a little goofy pretending to be a hindu here I mean, there's there's right. skepticism uh, that creeps in there for many of us uh, There's no dogma attached to your breath, right? <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, it's just like, just pay, I mean, here, here's the ba- basic hypothesis. If you want to understand your mind more deeply, if you want to become more sensitive to the mechanics of your happiness and suffering, it makes sense to pay attention, right? So the, let's see if you can pay attention. And the truth is, you know, for, you know I, I would invite all of our listeners to try this. If you tried to pay attention to something for the next minute, say, you know, let's say your breath. Uh, if you try, or you know, anything in your environment, you could just stare at an object and you try to do that to the exclusion of everything else. And in particular, you tried not to get carried away by thought while doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless you've had, unless you happen to be some kind of prodigy of concentration or you've trained significantly, the truth is you just won't be able to do that, right? And in the beginning, you'll be so distracted and distractible, you might not even notice how distracted you are, right? You, you, you might come away thinking, oh, I did it. I paid attention to my breath for right. a full minute. Uh, and, you know, so what, what, what next? You know, that was easy, right? That, the reality is that the more you attempt to do that, the more you'll discover that there's just 
there's just torrents of white noise in your mind, mm -hmm. which is this conversation you're having with yourself. You know, you're, you'll, um, you'll try to pay attention to the breath uh, and a voice in your head will, you know, will say, what's that guy talking about? I can pay attention to the breath, right? And, and, you're, and that's, a, that's a thought that you're not noticing. And it's a thought that feels, strangely, it feels like self, right? I mean, th there's this identity that, that many of us feel identical, you know, virtually everyone uh, by default feels identical to, which is this sense of being a thinker of thoughts or, or an experiencer of experience. So there's, mm -hmm. most people feel that there's, it's not that there's just experience uh, as a matter of their subjectivity, they feel that they're they're appropriating their experience. They're having an experience from some point of view as a subject inside their heads, mm -hmm. and that is the the central illusion that that meditation is really designed to inspect and ultimately cut through. And it it's it's something that falls away for us all the time, haphazardly. And those are the moments in life we most value. I mean, the, the, the moments of of flow or, or uh, you know, ecstasy or, you know, just, just a real connection with the present moment that, that seemed to come over us, but we can't control that, right? It's, it seems to depend on arranging things in the world uh, so as to be really extraordinary. I mean, you, if you're a surfer, you have to be actually catching, you know, the, a great wave mm -hmm. to feel suddenly slammed down into experience so fully that and the wave always has to be bigger and you have to go for something yeah, more every time. Exactly. And, 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 you know, you're, or, you know, you have to actually be having sex and it's just a moment that, you know, in sex that, you know, is, it may or may not come, right. It's like, like you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're seeking a peak experience mm -hmm. for the purpose of getting consciousness to fully coincide with the present moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it does, it does, you know, occasionally for, for everybody. And, and that's why people value specific experiences. And then, then life becomes a, a really a, an unending effort to keep arranging experience such that we can have more and more moments like that. And we're constantly trying to get back to our favorite things on the menu. Um, what, what meditation teaches you is that it's really not about those diverse experiences there's nothing nothing wrong with having those experiences and and you, you know you'll continue to enjoy them but th what 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 really is the principle there is the quality of attention right it's not the fact that you happen to be in the ocean and covered with salt water and getting pushed around by a wave that that makes surfing so extraordinary for someone who, who's really into it. Um, it's the, because it really, we're just talking about a, a collection of sensations, right? We're just talking about, you know, your five senses and proprioception. And it's, it's just not, you know, that is not what is so extraordinary. What's so extraordinary is that it has done something to your mind that you haven't figured out how to do any other way, right? And meditation is a technique for directly seizing the reins there and learning to that that paying attention to anything sufficiently yields that kind of of reward and it, it really can be any arbitrary object even something as simple as the breath you know and, and something as as apparently boring as the breath so in the beginning you you attempt to do that you attempt to pay attention to the breath and you the first thing you notice is how hard that is and and um I mean, as you know, as you say, uh, you know, on the point of anxiety, um, people, you know, people can tend to encounter a lot of resistance. They can, they can, they can the the mental effort of paying attention can be unpleasant. Um, but the reality is, is that you can simply just drop back and relax. There, there is no straining effort that is that is actually required to do this. What you need to do is is just recognize that you're already fully paying attention to something. I mean, you, you can notice simply what you're noticing in each moment. And 
uh, and this is where the, the second type of meditation is is more relevant. It's, and this is it's just more interesting ultimately. And, and it's the one I recommend, which is, you know, you're not trying, you're not trying to focus on one thing, not the breath or anything else to the exclusion of everything else. You're simply trying to notice clearly whatever you're in fact noticing. So, so sounds and other sensations in the body and ultimately even thoughts themselves are not, are not distractions from meditation as long as you're clearly noticing what's arising in consciousness. Uh, and so you, in the end, you, you really want your mind to be like a mirror where everything just is spontaneously reflected you know, whenever it comes before it. And it's, there's, no, there's no effort required. The mirror doesn't have to reach out and seize its objects, right? It just, you know, it, it, it is just this, this luminous context in which everything is appearing. And your mind can be like that. And it's not, you don't have to make it like that. It's already like that, but you, but meditation is the process whereby you would recognize that and become more familiar with it. Hey, is there something that's interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Maybe it's anxiety or stress or worry with how much is going on in the world right now. Well, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating with them in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. And there's a broad range of expertise available depending on what you need. And there's service available for clients worldwide. And you can log into your account at any time, send messages to your counselor, and BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change your counselors if you need to. And it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. And BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today, so visit betterhelp.com dial, that's better H-E-L-P, and join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with help from an experienced professional and get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com dial. Yeah, I love that. I I did a, a vipassana um, about two years ago, and it's crazy. Exactly like you're saying, the, the first three or four days of vipassana, the only thing they tell you to do is just watch your breath go in and out of your nose, and just feel what it feels like to have it go in and out of your nose. And you notice where, that. Where did you do that? Who, who, who um, did I did it out in in Dallas, right outside of Dallas. There's a, a vipassana center that's out there. Uh huh. And was it a, a ten day retreat or? Yeah, ten day retreat, nice. and they follow uh you know the traditional vipassana and. You can't look anybody in the eyes. You can't journal. You can't do yoga. You can, I mean, literally all that you can do is you can either meditate or you can go for a walk outside in this little tiny area that they had. And what you notice is how many, what I notice specifically is, is how I could only get to like two or three breaths before my mind was already somewhere else. Hmm. And the thing that they tell you is not to judge the fact that your mind is going everywhere. Just bring it back. And that's one of the hardest things that people tend to just you know, judge themselves. Oh my God, there goes my mind again. No, it's not about that. It's just about bringing your mind back and just going, okay, yep, we did it again. You know, you went off and, and now we're going to bring it back. And it's funny because after seven days, it, it started getting, you know, started getting easier. And then eighth day, and I remember eighth or ninth day, I was sitting there and I was about two and a half hours into meditation. And I just started to cry because of how amazing I felt like the amount of presence and joy. I was mm -hmm. like, I, if I didn't have to go to the bathroom, I could stay here forever. And it was just, I've never felt so good in my life just by sitting there and meditating. And it's kind of like the thing I love about what you're saying is that whether it's surf or sex or roller coaster or racing that somebody wants to get into that, that brings them to the present moment. It's really the amount of that they love is the amount of presence that they are feeling in that moment. And I guess from what we're saying is that meditation is allowing you to get rid of all of the distractions and bring as much presence as you possibly can to a present moment so that even just sitting there and watching your kids play without feeling like you have to check your phone, the amount of presence and attention that you can bring to that moment makes your life more rich. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately it's not about changing experience. So it's very easy to get the sense that the goal of meditation is to experience uh, extraordinarily pleasant states of mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, as, as you point out, the, those those states are available, right? I mean, the, you can certainly go onto a retreat and develop significant concentration. And along with that concentration, you, you, just th these amazing uh, 
qualities of mind begin to develop, right? You, you, you can feel bliss and rapture mm -hmm. and, 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 and thoughts can cease to arise and, and, and you can lose all sense of your body. So you, the, the mind becomes this really vast open space. Uh, and it's very drug-like, right? It, it can, it's, you know, it, oh, yeah. it's very much like taking, you know, certain psychedelics or, or MDMA or and you can, you can be in an altered state and, it's very, I mean, it's, it's almost inevitable that someone who, who has that experience for the first time or even the hundredth time will, will think, okay, this is the, the center of the bullseye. I mean, this is, this is why I meditate. This is why I you know, put, my, put my life on hold to come on this retreat. This is, now it's working, right? This is the, the whole point. And if I could just feel more like this most of the time, uh, you know, I, I'd be good. Right. This is, you know, this is, this is the project to get yeah. back here and stay here. But the problem is it's another trap. <laughs> yeah. Anything, any, any change in the character of experience of that sort is predicated on some causes and conditions coming together, which are by their very nature unstable, right? You have mm -hmm. to be very concentrated. You can't be, you know, you can't be checking your email you can't be, you're, 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 as you said, you know, I could see if I could, if I didn't have to go to the bathroom, I could stay here. Right. Mm -hmm. But you do have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the more fundamental insight, which is really the, the ultimate purpose of this kind of practice is to recognize that, that consciousness itself, right. That the very consciousness that you would use to check your email or go to the bathroom or, or do anything else that, that seems to be not meditating, that consciousness is already wide open, free of self, mm -hmm. free of any kind of impediment. I mean, there's just no, there's no problem. There's no problem to solve when you in consciousness as consciousness. And that is the, that is the thing that is experiencing everything, including s states of, of mind and body like anxiety or anger. Right. And, um, and so, Ultimately, mindfulness becomes a, a practice of recognizing the, the openness and clarity and, and centerlessness, you know, the, the selflessness of, of, of mere awareness, whatever's arising. And you can do that in the, middle of, in the midst of your ordinary life and in the midst of even you know, seemingly undesirable and you know, neurotic states of mind, the very states of mind you're trying to get rid of, or, you know, maybe trying to get rid of by practicing meditation. So something like anxiety. So for instance, let's say you're, you know, say you're afraid of public speaking and you, you need to go out and, and give a, a, a lecture and you, ha you have all this anticipatory anxiety, that experience, right? That, that can be punctuated by mindfulness uh, in a way that, that really is freeing and it can be freeing even in the midst of anxiety, which is to say that, that you, can, you can recognize that you're free in some basic sense, even before the, the physiology of anxiety has dissipated. Right? Mm -hmm. And you can, you can also reframe it as, as um, just energy, essentially. I mean, like you're, you know, cause it, it, when you're mindful of anxiety, like because there's there's the, the physiology of it, the sensations in your body and in your face, right? And at, at the level of raw sensation, it, anxiety is very similar to other states of mind that you actually like, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the, like the, the, the thrill of doing something that, you know, seems to be risky or, you know, or going on a roller coaster, or, you know, or go, you know, going white, white water rafting or, or whatever it is that, you, that gives you an, a slightly ad adrenalized thrill, right? something you would pay to do, right? Um, that is very close to what you're feeling when you are, are having to give a, a lecture or a presentation and are nervous about it. Mm -hmm. It's just the frame around it is different. The, the, the cognitive uh, uh, summary of the experience is different. And, but when you get out of this, the, the story you're telling yourself and you just connect with the raw sensations, they're not that bad. And they're, and in fact, they're not even valenced as bad or good. I mean, they're, they're, they're really indistinguishable from, again, the guy who's about to go on a roller coaster or, or uh, get on a, a, a jujitsu mat or, or something. Um, and so 
breaking that connection is actually stepping out of the thoughts and going to the raw experience can be freeing, really freeing, even before the, the qualities of experience have changed. I mean, they will change because the truth is once you break the spell of identification with thought, it's, it's impossible to stay anxious or angry or in any of these classically negative states of mind for very long at all. I mean, the half-life of these emotions is very short, but they do have a half-life. So if, you were, if you're thinking anxiety-producing thoughts and then you suddenly become mindful, you can, you can break the connection to psychological suffering instantly you know, and, and just become interested and, and open to the sensations in your body. But the sensations have a half-life of their own, you know, little, you know, 30 seconds, say. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's in the, the amazing thing is that even coincident with classically unpleasant experience, you can recognize that, that your mind is just this open uh, context in which everything is appearing and find the freedom in that. And that, and that freedom is, isn't actually predicated on the next really pleasant thing happening. It's not predicated on, oh my God, this feels so good. You know, it, 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 that's, that's more of a, again, that's more of your, you, you, when you're doing that, you, you leap back on the treadmill of, of seeking to change your experience. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not that you can't change your experience, but all these changes are impermanent. And, and eventually we have to become interested in what what is the, the context of these changes. And that, that's what meditation ultimately is. Yeah, I love that. And and yeah, there's actually, a, I did an episode on this not, not too long ago about anxiety and excitement. You know, there's a, a, an actual clinical term called arousal congruent, the way it's the, mm. the physio like the actual physiolog physiological feelings inside of your body are exactly the same between anxiety and excitement. And it's called anxious reappraisal. Whenever you're just really anxious, you can actually trick your brain into thinking that it's actually excited. And yeah. they've done a lot of studies on this, but really what you're in, in that going to, it actually is semi against what you're talking about in the first place, which is not even trying to change the emotions. It's just trying to be free from the emotions and not identify yourself as the emotion, right? Because some people say, oh, I'm an anxious person. And when you now have the identity of an anxious person, the habits, the traits, the qualities, the thoughts that you have are now going to be congruent with those, that identity that you've now said for yourself. So what you're talking about is seeing the emotion, feeling the emotion and taking a step back and going, yeah, but it's going to end one time I'm not, and, and I'm free from this emotion. And it seems like in that moment is actually where you step back and you're able to give yourself some power. Yeah. Well, I would recommend both. I, I think both approaches are very useful and you know, practically speaking, indispensable for for most of us, you know, it's not that you couldn't accomplish all of this with just meditation, but mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, to take the, the, the specific case of public speaking, right? I think the way to get comfortable in that circumstance is to get comfortable in that circumstance, right? You can't, you know, you know theoretically, you could spend 10 years in a cave meditating, never, uh, never testing your comfort in public speaking and get over your, your hangups. And then, you know, then magically find that when you're thrust in front of an audience, you're totally comfortable. You know, that that's conceivable. I, I think that the mind uh, can certainly work that way, but uh, for most of us, it, the experience would be uh, it, to, to, to continually meet in ourselves, this habit pattern of becoming anxious in response to this particular stimulus. And then the, then the, the opportunity seems to be, okay, uh, I can be mindful of the anxiety. I can be compassionate with myself around the anxiety. I can be, I can be non-judgmental. I can keep dropping back and relaxing. I can, I can decide that this is, this is just not a bad experience. This is just, just, this is just the experience and that's okay. Uh, but I think it's it's rational to want something more than that, which is there's no reason for this anxiety, really, right? Mm -hmm. And there's and you can you want to be able to to find some point of leverage in yourself so that it's just this is no longer a problem fundamentally, right? And there, the you know techniques of of cognitive reappraisal and reframing 
are, are just very useful. And, and it's, um, and also just the sort of the, this is more like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, just becoming just manageable exposure to the stimulus that freaks you out uh, and becoming more and more comfortable uh, in its presence. Right. And, and this is a kind of, you know, it's almost like a, a muscle building uh, principle here. I mean, you're just, you're, you're just gradually increasing the load on yourself and becoming more and more comfortable with it. And then b things begin to shift where, you know, you, you know, whether or not anxiety, you know, whether or not you're still adrenalized at all, it doesn't have the same meaning. I mean, you know, I, I used to be someone who was, who was truly uh, afraid of public speaking. I mean, it was something mm -hmm. that I, I took steps to avoid Right, and then at a certain point, I, it was unavoidable. I, I was publishing my first book. I realized I had to do a, a book tour, and um, so I just had to get over it. And yeah, yes, mindfulness was certainly a, a part of getting over it, but I just also had to do it. And you know, then you know, if I if I have to give a a speech now, I'm sure if you if you were tracking my galvanic skin response and my cortisol levels and, and, you know, every other physiological measure of anxiety, you would detect a change in my state, right? It's not, I mean, if I, if I have to go out on stage in front of 3000 people, uh, it's not exactly the same as me just, you know, walking down to the kitchen and, and making myself a cup of tea, right? Something right. I'm sure I'm adrenalized to some degree, but the whole thing has been so totally reframed for me that there's no problem with any of that. In fact, that energy is is useful, right? It, it, it makes me, you know, less of a, a sleepy guy. That I mean, I, I'm a, I'm I tend to be a low energy guy anyway. Um, I, you know, I can use a little energy. Um, so it's um, it and and a lot of that is more than just mindfulness. It, it is it is more it is simply having the experience. And finding the various gears within it, and um, and and just getting, you know, frankly, succeeding at it, right? Getting positive feedback for doing the thing in the first place, that begins to to rewire your brain. And so it's, um, I mean, the, the basic principle here is that you know, your brain is a, a machine that changes based on how it has been used, right? I mean, this is just neuroplasticity mm -hmm. has, has this as a consequence. You know, your, your brain is continually changing you know, as a matter of its physical structure and, and, and its moment-to-moment -moment function uh, and capacity to function in the future. It, it, it becomes uh, what you do with it in, in some basic sense. And this is, there's a, an analogy here to what we spoke about earlier in terms of our, you know, our exposure to, to social media and media in general, it's a, you know, you know, every one of us has noticed that YouTube is training itself to predict what we will want to see, right? I mean, the algorithm is, is, really is responding <laughs> to how we use it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and on some, in some basic sense, you get more of what you click on, right? If you, if you keep clicking on, on uh, films about, uh, you know, bears attacking, uh, you know, other animals, uh, you, you, you just start seeing animal attack videos being sent your way, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they, they tend to get more extreme. Um, and that is a, there's a deep analogy there with our own minds and brains, right? You, 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 you begin to conform to what you pay attention to. You begin to conform to what you have found rewarding, and uh, in, in some basic sense, you can make your mind. I mean, you can you can intelligently guide and, and curate uh, the contents of consciousness such that you become one way rather than another way. And I mean, I think you said this at the, at the beginning of our conversation that this, you know, in some sense, each of us is a pro at remaining distracted. And mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're, you know, each of us really is the world champion at <laughs> remaining similar to who we were yesterday. Right. right? And that is not, that's not destiny. That's not, uh, you know, we're not condemned 
to be that way. I mean, we're, uh, we're making a thousand choices that we're not even aware are choices each day. And, you know, something like meditation practice is a, is a choice. It seems like a, 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 seems like a real choice that people have to make. I mean, they, they, they do feel like they have to sort of get behind themselves and push in order to do it. And it takes some discipline, but eventually it just becomes a quality of your mind. I mean, it becomes something that's not actually what you're doing with your legs crossed on a cushion. Mm -hmm. And then you stop doing when you go check your email. No, it becomes, it becomes a kind of default state of your own uh, awareness where you're just, this is, this is just how you see the world. And meditation in that case is, is not something you're adding to experience. It's, it's something you're doing less of. It really is just less distraction. Right? You're yeah. just, you're just, just whenever you're not distracted, that is meditation. Once you know how to meditate, and that's, that's not something you could say of somebody who, who doesn't know what they're doing. I mean, their way is to be focused and to not be meditating. You can be, you know, hyper focused on, on something that you hate, right? And that's, that's not meditation. But um, once you know how to meditate, it's, um, it's compatible with any other experience. I mean, this, is, this can sound a little paradoxical, but because, because people often want to say, well, you know, I, I don't meditate, but I jog or I, you know, I play music or I, you know, I listen to music or I, I go out in nature and as though those things were substitutes for learning how to meditate. And the truth is that they're not substitutes I and mean, they're not remotely substitutes. I mean, you're no more learning to meditate by, doing athletics or, you know, walking in nature or, or playing music or dancing or whatever it is you like to do, then you're, then any of those things substitute for any other. But the reality is, is that once you know how to meditate in particular, how to be mindful and, and non-distracted, well, then you can do that doing any of those other things. You can do right. that while, yeah. while jogging or surfing or whatever it is. And uh, and then those things become synonymous with meditation, but it, it, the bridge can only be walked in in one direction, right? You just can't you can't get there from just jogging more. And yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah, that's I, I was really open up to that when I went. I was over in Thailand and I spent a couple of days with some monks over there, and they taught us a walking meditation. It's a slow meditation where it's just, but it, it, you can't just take it and go. Well, I'm just going to walk, and that's going to be my meditation every single day. And and I think it's it's almost like escapism for a lot of people trying to find something to do to escape from this present moment. I'm curious your opinion, or if you happen to have any, any actual data on this as well, but you know, are people running from something? That's, that's what I'm always so curious of. Is it, is the present moment so hard because we're running from something like, or, or is it, like you said, the quality of our mind, we don't want to come in contact with that, or we don't want to think about past traumas, or we don't want to think about, we, you know, have a job that we hate. Are there, do you feel like people are running from something or is it just because we've trained ourselves not to be present? Well, I think it can be both, but part of it is just this, this, um, unhappy accident of evolution. I, I think what's happened is that language in particular, you know, conceptual thought in general, but linguistic thought in particular is so useful for us. I mean, just as social primates, we have evolved this capacity and it is the thing that makes us human. I mean, it is, it is mm -hmm. the why, it is why we are so much more interesting than our ape cousins. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it is how we create culture. It's how we pass down knowledge, you know, you know, brain to brain and, and, and across generations. It's the basis of everything we do. And it's, um, and yet it is, it is a kind of curse psychologically for most of us, most of the time, mm -hmm. right? Because, because once this gets, once this conversation gets started, once it and it gets internalized, I mean, just look at what happens with a, you know, with a young child. A young child is is more or less, you know, discovered in his or her crib by others, but before he or she discovers uh, himself there, right? Like, like there, there's no, there's there can't be a significant sense of self certainly not a, you know, a consciously, you know, recursive one mm -hmm. in a, 
in a six month old child, right? Now right. the some rudiments of of individuation there, but what's what's happening is you have a you have a mind which is is continually confronted with, by other people for whom it is an object in the world, right? I mean, like you're being perceived as an object in the world by your parents right. mainly, and they're talking to you. And you have this, you know, you, you, you come into this world with the, the operating system that, that is, is poised to learn language and poised to learn how to differentiate uh, self from world. And this gets tuned up in dialogue with your parents, but it's, gets, it's, it's really, it takes, a, it takes a while. And you, you begin to participate in this language game uh, and you're always, you know, well, once you can learn to talk, you're, 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 you're talking to your parents uh, and then you begin to talk to them on, in some sense when they're not there, right? They leave the room and you're still mm -hmm. chattering. Uh, and you're talking to yourself uh, as though that made any sense, right? I mean, so, so just look at the structure of our subjectivity here and how peculiar it is. Um, I mean, when, when we're alone with our thoughts, we are very often in conversation, explicit conversation with ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And, and we'll, we'll, we'll be narrating our experience to ourselves as though there was some part of us that wasn't also having the experience. Like, you know, so who true. are we, yeah. who are we telling, right? Like what, you know, if, if, uh, if, you know, I'm looking for something on my desk and I find it, I might think, oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, but I, I see it. Right. <laughs> who am I telling? Like, is there somebody right. else in the search party right. right, who needs to be told that we found this thing? Right. Um, there's a, there's a, an implied duality here. It makes absolutely no sense. And to just to get a to kind of triangulate on yourself and get a sense of how crazy and, and, and non-normative your your default thinking is, just imagine how crazy you would seem if all of your thoughts were broadcast on a loudspeaker <laughs> for everyone to hear. Right? If you yeah. have to get, wherever you walked, you, you know, you walk into a room and you just helplessly externalized every single judgment and comparison yeah. and self-judgment and half noticing. And it's like, well, why is she doing that? And what's, what's, what's with that hair? Like, mm -hmm. just, just like, just you, you, you compulsively fragment the, the experience with this, this just uh, logoria, right? I mean, you're just, mm -hmm. you're just vomiting words on everything all yep. the time inside. And the only, the, the, the real difference between a normal, you know, healthy you know, mind and the mind of a psychotic is the, you know, we have the good sense to keep our mouths shut, right? If you're, if you're doing, if you're talking to yourself, you know, out loud in public, well then people, you know, within three seconds, people understand that you're crazy, yep. right? And all of us have done that too. I mean, some of us, you know, we we talk to ourselves when we're, we're when we're alone. We'll say something out loud. I mean, sometimes, you know, your, your thoughts escape your lips. Uh, but if 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 that happens compulsively, well, then that is kind of the bright dividing line between mental illness and normal <laughs> unhappiness. Mm -hmm. But the normal unhappiness is so similar to mental illness, right? It's so similar to being asleep and dreaming and not knowing that you're dreaming. And and so so, uh, on some level, the 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 um, the real context here for meditation is to is to form a different expectation about what it means to be healthy and and quote normal and mm -hmm. you know like what is what is a you just how what can you expect of your mind on a on a day to day basis and what would you, what, what is, what do you write to, to expect here? And it does, it just, it does take some training to even see, the, see a, a glimmer of daylight here so that you can see that, the, okay, it's actually possible to uh, be at peace more and more of the time and, and actually most of the time. And, and when you get destabilized by 
anxiety or anger or you know something you know there's some is there is some real emergency in your life well then that that swing into into obvious mental suffering need not last very long right like for, you know, most people's you know, before you know how to meditate and you, you know if you get angry if something something in the world makes you angry you will be as angry for as long as you'll you'll be angry right like there's nothing there's there's nothing but just the 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 dynamics of your own conditioning that will determine uh, or or some intervention from the world that will determine how much of an emergency that becomes for you and how and how how fully you you destabilize your own life based on on the things you might say and do based on being angry right like what are you going to say to the people you're angry at right and how deranging of your relationships is that going to be right you're just you're complete you're just hurled on on the winds of of your conditioning um and yet once you develop a, even a, a little bit of mindfulness you then have the ability to to, to decide how long you want to stay on that ride for right and you can you can literally just step off and mm. and decide okay anger is serving no purpose here i'm uh, you know i'm over it and you can do that very very quickly because again the half life of a of a emotion like anger is very very short when you're no longer lost in in the thoughts that are telling you that you should be angry about this thing yeah so it's a, it becomes a kind of superpower to be able to do that yeah i always say the the path of growth for most people is realizing that something happens and there's a reaction to it and that reaction can last you know so, someone can do something to me and i can be pissed off at her for a week before I start working on myself and trying to become mindful and start reading and, and better myself and grow. And as I work on myself for a year or two years, that that thing can happen again. And maybe it's five days this time instead of seven days. And then you work myself for a few more days. Maybe it's three days, maybe it's one day. And then you get it down to maybe it's 30 minutes. And then the real path is that, you know, something could happen and you might not even react to it because you might reframe the situation that just happened. And really that's the the path to growth that, that people are working for is that no matter what circumstances come at me, I will be able to handle them by building up my strong mind. And, um, and I want to, I want to take a really weird pivot because I'm really, really curious with this as well. One thing that, that, that you're really good at obviously is mindfulness meditation, understanding the human mind. But I know that you also have, you know, the, your thumb on the pulse of what's going on in the world, um, politics, that type of stuff that's happening. And I'm really curious. There's one thing that you said in one of the interviews I was listening to, and this was actually a few years ago, was that we have to be open to the fact that we might be wrong. And in fact, probably are wrong a lot of the time. And I'm, I, I love that because I've actually tried to be like, hey, maybe I'm always wrong. And, and I feel like lately, I don't know if you felt this way, a lot of people are so stuck into who they are in their beliefs, their political beliefs, whatever happens. And I've noticed, and I'm sure everybody else listening has, that it seems like over the past year, maybe, the divide between one side and another side, whatever side those are, um, has gotten really strong from one side to the other. And I'm curious with you, do you feel like it's it's a psychological thing of tribalism of, you know, I am a Democrat or I'm a Republican or I believe in this and I believe in this and, and that people are the, the psychological, you know, this is who we are and this is how I've been for millions of years, the, the tribalism that's kicking in and it's really hard because of all of the circumstances have gotten harder over the past year? Or do you feel um, that maybe there is a system that's actually working against in, against us in our own psychology and creating the circumstances that's making us divide faster? Well, there's a lot of tribalism you know, and tribalism is something that we're evolved to participate in, mm -hmm. right? So this is, this is really old legacy code, you know, pre pre predates our humanity even. Right. Um, so there's that layer of things. And then it's being leveraged by technology again, because now your tribalism can be can be amplified it can mm -hmm. be it can be brought to scale you know you, you, your tweet can go viral right so mm -hmm. you can be seemingly leading the tribe in any moment right right and you can also silo yourself so that you're not getting any kind of information corrective from from you know any other tribe right so you're you're you can become 
you know, informationally xenophobic, you know, and 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 really succeed at that, right? You can mm -hmm. you can you can kind of pre-stigmatize any inconvenient information in such a way that you you live in a in a in a hermetically sealed worldview. Yeah. And and because of the internet, I mean, because of just how much information there is on anything right now, because it's not just you and a few crazy people in your village. It's it's you know thousands of people at minimum for anything you want to get embedded in, right? Mm. So it's so reinforcing you can get, it almost. Yeah, you can get endless reinforcement for the craziest possible idea. If that's <laughs> if you, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, yeah, and you know, and you know, I mean, literally, you can be a flat earther yep. and just spend full days seemingly having your your you know genuinely genuinely crazy idea mm -hmm. confirmed right mm -hmm. and what's more the 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 provenance of this information it can be rendered o opaque in a way that that it never could be in the real world right so like if if you were let's say going going to be um you know, totally obsessed with uh, the, the idea that people are getting abducted by UFOs, right? Like the, the, the abduction phenomenon is something you take a, a strong interest in. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you believe it's it's really happening, and you read a bunch of books on it, and and yeah, it just this seems like it's really worth your attention. And you know, the, the intergalactic travelers have come here for no purpose other than to to uh, you know, uh, probe us anally and kill our cattle, and 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 it's a, a kind of a strange, a strange agenda. But clearly, mm -hmm. it's happening, right? Um, it, it used to be that if you were going to get really into that, well, then you you would have to kind of physically go to one of these conferences and meet the people who are also right. really into that. And it would just so happen that you there would be many other social cues that would begin to you know reveal other you know. Uh, other aspects of this project that are that give some clue as to why it's you know fairly disreputable, right? I mean, you're 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 meeting people who um, are um, for the most for the most part advertising their capacity to believe in lots of crazy things, right? Um, uh, this doesn't capture everyone who's ever paid attention to that phenomenon, but it's it's just there's a there's a um, uh, there are many tells, you know, to to to, to the the problem of of somebody you know devoting their lives to something that is 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 fringe and mm -hmm. and requires a lot of you know conspiratorial uh, thinking that is not governed by the most careful principles of reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of a, a you know it's not an accident that you know p people who believe one outlandish conspiracy theory tend to believe many of them, if not all of them, right? And right. many of them are working in, at cross purposes and people are comfortable with the, the incoherence there. Um, but so g having to do that in the, in, the, in the brick and mortar world was one thing, but now doing it online, you just, you, it's, it's stripped away from all of those, those uh, contextualizing cues, right? You're not meeting the, the, the people who, you know, don't bathe quite enough, <laughs> right? You're seeing a, right. a, a fairly slickly produced video that you know, may have been produced by some 18 year old in, in his mother's basement, but right. is really pretty well done, right? And you're, you're not in a position to, to debunk it, right? And all of a sudden it becomes yet another data point in your worldview that is, that may in fact be just, um, you know, Every bit as persuasive to you as a a documentary, you know, that took a million dollars to produce and is getting run on Frontline on PBS that night, right? And and just you, you, basically, you think you have in hand the the Frontline version of the confirmation of of uh, whatever it is, and so there's there's a a leveling of of um, a kind of a reputational leveling and a, right. a, and a um, uh, a, co a coincident loss of trust in the normal gatekeepers of information, and and some of this, you know, loss of trust has been has been earned, right? I mean, the, sure. know, ma many of these these institutions have 
degraded themselves in how in, in how partisan they've become or how um, just how, just how gamified they've been by the, the change in business models of you know, you know online right I mean the, the, the click baitification of everything has crept into even you know the New York Times and and you know our best organs of journalism so you know that's a problem with the business model and and um, you know the technology but it has left us, we just don't have a cognitive immune system for this yet. We have mm. to build one. And it's, it's left us in, in this very precarious place where, you know, our politics and our ability to, to, to collaborate with one another generally and just to find common projects that we, are, we agree on, right? You know, how do, how do we respond to a pandemic, right? Mm. What do we do about global warming? Is global warming even a thing, right? Is, that, mm. is, it, is it a Chinese hoax? The president just said it's a Chinese hoax. Well, mm -hmm. what do I think about that? Uh, how can I know? Oh, let's listen to Alex Jones for the next four hours, <laughs> right? That it's it's completely deranging, and um, we so we have to find some way to to put our house in order, and it's it's it is a real challenge. I think what it all comes back to, whether it's meditation, whether it's all this, is is full self reliance and realizing that you're in control of every thought that you have. Whether it wants to be crazy and completely out there, and you want to go out and and Google it and see if you can reinforce that thought, or if you just you know see every see every thought that's coming in and go, all right, well you know that's a thought that's coming in. I'm not attached to it, and you know don't put any emotion behind it as well. The thing that I love about about what you preach is you know it's it's kind of you have to go out there and experience it, right? There's no dogma behind it. It's, it's, it's for you to go out and experience and see what works for you, what doesn't work for you, but ultimately the power is in your hands, which is the most beautiful part about it. But, um, but yeah, I appreciate uh, your time. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Well, Rob, I just add one thing here. So I mean, a crucial piece here is to become sensitive to the, the mechanics of all of this. And again, this right. is the meditation is the tool you would use to, to become sensitive. But right. I mean, for instance, to notice that, the way certain facts or arguments or information make you feel, mm. right, is separable from the truth of any proposition, right? So if you know somebody tells you something that is a fact, and this causes you anxiety, or you know you're disgusted that that such a thing could even be true, mm -hmm. or you're you're you you notice that you you hope it's true. Right, like the, all of these, the 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 emotional val valence to any uh, with which your mind greets any proposition, um, that is separable from evidence for or against that proposition. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so when someone is challenging one of your your cherished beliefs, and you feel angry or anxious or you know, it's, it's just some some. You, you're in the grip of some psychological rejection state, mm -hmm. right? That that should it, most pe most people's default setting is that that f the very feeling itself is evidence against the proposition, right? Mm -hmm. Or f you know for it in, in in the opposite case when you, you know, when when you want to believe something, and the first thing to notice is that that's just not true, right? I mean that is a guaranteed way to be misled in life, right? That is the, that is the, the, the emotional code that gives us, you know, confirmation bias and wishful thinking and, mm -hmm. and, and several, you know, you know, obvious, uh, you know, reasoning fallacies and, and, you know, bad heuristics. And so to, to, to step out of the, the, the mechanics of that is really important. And, and, you know, the, the, the alternate, piece of code you could be could be running here is is just to become interested mm. in your reactions mm -hmm. to things like that i mean to have kind of have the metacognitive uh, layer of of just just being curious yep. about what does it say about me that i'm so uh reactive to this proposition that i'm you know i'm spending all my my fuel now trying to figure out what's wrong with it and how to knock it down rather than just entertaining the argument for a few more seconds right mm -hmm. um and you know, so, so philosophy is is very good training for this because in, in philosophy you you're often especially moral philosophy you're, you're often 
entertaining things that uh, you know, or just you know would would bother anyone else, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I did a podcast with with someone who's a um, you know what's called an antinatalist, right? Somebody who thinks that you're you're by bringing children into the world, you're creating great harm because mm-hmm. life is 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 really unendurable in the end and and it's, it's, it's you're basically committing a, a crime on anyone who you bring into the world and therefore you know it's a good thing not to have kids it'd be a good thing for all of us to disappear right there, there are many different flavors of this this kind of nihilism but anyway there are people who are committed to this idea that like you know, life is not worth living we should mm-hmm. admit, admit it if we all died in our sleep tonight, that that would be a net positive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's um, and, and a few a few things follow from that that you know strike many people as starkly unethical or at least undesirable. And and, and so you, you sort of get into into the the thicket of of these thoughts, and you can you can just have a bad taste in your mouth. You can think, I don't, you know, I don't want to think about this. This is awful. And, you know, who, who is this person who would, who would try to spread these ideas, mm-hmm. right? But you can completely flip the script here and just become interested in, in right. both the ideas and in, 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 the, in the game of trying to figure out where, you know, what's wrong with them. And, and in the discovery, I mean, the, the, the thing you, you should learn to find mental pleasure in is to discover that you are wrong about something of consequence, right? Yep. And that's, uh, that is a, that is a, a um, kind of a, a firmware upgrade that most people have not downloaded at this point. Most people mm-hmm. do not want to discover where they're wrong, and they certainly take no pleasure in it, right? Right. Uh, and this is this is something that I I really I strongly recommend that that you that people find this gear and and begin to to seek it out because it's that is the the ultimate error correcting mechanism right to 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 be asking the question what if you're wrong mm-hmm. to be interested in it and and ultimately to be rewarded by it because the, the thing is you don't I mean the, what we see so often is this this doubling down phenomenon where where it becomes obvious that somebody's wrong, it's it's certainly obvious to most of the people in the audience, and yet you see this person doubling down and tripling down on a bad idea, right? Mm-hmm. And it's 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 mortifying, or it should be it should be mortifying, right? This is the, you you shouldn't want to be wrong publicly, emphatically, longer than you need to be, right? Mm-hmm. And so you, you you know what you want is the cognitive flexibility. I mean, even if if your only concern is for how you appear as an ego in the world, the the, the way you want to appear is flexible enough to realize that you were wrong before your opponents do, right? right. Or 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 the or you you're so fast to recognize it that when they point it out they don't even get the satisfaction of landing a blow on you because mm-hmm. you're already pivoting. You're already mm-hmm. saying, oh yeah, well, that's a good point, of course. And you, it, they get the pleasure of instructing you and they don't even feel like they've consummated a debate anymore. It just feels like, okay, this is just, he wasn't, I, you know, I, I tried to hit him in the face, but his face wasn't there long enough, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, even if egocentricity is your, you know, your your true operating system, right? Um you still don't want to be one of these people who is doubling down on an obvious error ever, right? And and yet so many people just can't, it, it's, it really is a kind of childlike, um, you know, automaticity where they just, it's a reflex. It's like, okay, I, I've got, it, it's, it's, it's some version of the sunk cost fallacy, right? You've, you've been committed to this thing and so you've invested in it and now you're going to throw good money after bad until you know essentially you go broke mm-hmm. uh, reputationally and you know you see so much of that on social media and it's so reinforced within the echo chamber of any kind of digital tribe that i mean that w- what is so dysfunctional here is that there's so many ecosystems now you can find where nobody's keeping score in any kind of honest way i mean the, in my view the ultimate example of this is 
is in Trump's bubble, right? I mean, like, like mm-hmm. nobody, nobody who is a fan of Trump is actually keeping track of his errors, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they don't, they don't care about his errors, right? And so he has learned not to care about his errors, and it it becomes a kind of I'm sure you've seen these these fake martial art videos, mm-hmm. right? Where you have the 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 grandmaster of some <laughs> yeah. completely fake martial art. Someone who, just falls over. <laughs> yeah. Who, who, but 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 the truth is you can get deep enough into that world where apparently you, the fake martial artist who's knocking people over with magic, believes that he actually has magical powers. Right, mm-hmm. because no one has dis- it's been decades since anyone resisted you, right? Everyone has been collaborating with your bullshit for years. And I mean, it's, it's gotten to the point, I, mean, I don't know if you've seen these videos, but there, there's been a couple of cases where these fake martial artists have issued challenges to out to the world of uh, other martial artists, oh, you know, yeah. people, who are, people who are not part of their cult to come in and test my powers. And, you know, they, there's this one ghastly video of this, you know, 80 year old master of hocus pocus just getting repeatedly punched in the face by yep. a, a real martial artist yeah i've seen hey, that one like, like that that disconfirmation uh you know where where you you bump into hard objects in in reality that doesn't happen enough in in in, in i mean it, there are certain places where it, it is guaranteed to happen and mm-hmm. that's um yeah, but you know, unfortunately, those are those corrections are coming from the the unspoken world, right? Like you know, the world of a pandemic. You know, the coronavirus doesn't care uh, about our politics; it just cares about the actual dynamics of the the epidemiology, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it'll spread by its purpose, you know, by its its you know uh, principles, and it will uh, affect us to whatever degree it does, and. Then there's the layer of all of our talking about it and disagreeing about it and mm. fighting about whether or not to wear masks and you know and and um, it's if if we're going to thrive as a species, we have to get the map to fit the territory better and better. And mm-hmm. what we're seeing more and more now is that you know the the cartographers have lost their minds <laughs> I mean, and they're they're shrieking at one another and they're not making any sense right and, and so that's um and it certainly doesn't help when you see that style of conversation begin to invade science and and journalism and as it as it has yeah yeah i completely agree and it's it seems like with both of them it's more of like wh- whether it's the meditation whether it's realizing that you're wrong and admitting it it's a mental gym it's 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 realizing yeah. that there's growth through all of it there's growth through sitting through a meditation when you don't want to and, and seeking that growth there's growth in going damn i was wrong you know there's growth yeah. in that versus and 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 that's where people should get their their dopamine release from is from Oh, I'm getting growth from this of realizing that I was wrong versus my dopamine release is proving to myself that I'm right. And yeah. I think if, if we could all if we could all kind of take a page from that book, I think a lot of people would well, what would be a better place if more people meditated, more people admitted they were wrong. <laughs> That's for sure. So um I appreciate your time, man. Uh sure. I know that you're busy. And uh I know you've got an app, you've also got a podcast as well that are perfect for my listeners and people that are out there. So if people want to find you out on the internet, what's the best places to uh, to find you? Uh, well, for the app, it's just wakingup.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the podcast, uh, the podcast is called Making Sense. So you just search under that and you'll you'll get it. But uh, my website is samharris.org, which can get, give you all the other information about me. Amazing. Well, I, yeah. uh, I well, definitely thank you, Rob. appreciate It's great to talk to you. Absolutely, yeah. man. I hope you have a great day. Thank you for everything. You, you too. Take care. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you love this video, I've got another one you're going to love. Just click right here and watch it.